In Jakarta's Bulomas neighborhood, a family's life turned into a nightmare when robbers stormed their home. This wasn't just a theft, it was a brutal hostage situation. The family, including kids and elders, were trapped in a tiny room. The conditions were horrific. It was hot, cramped, and they were running out of air. By the time the police broke into the house, it was too late for some of them. Today's story is about a family tragedy in Indonesia driven by greed. Today, let's talk about the Triona House tragedy, also known as the Blomas Robbery. Before we get into the case, do you play games? Well, I'm a gamer and I've been hooked on this amazing game you can play on both mobile and PC. I love battles. I don't know, it's just so satisfying to win fights, especially team battles. This game is packed with over 800 characters that we can acquire called champions, like elves, orcs, and even demons. And I can strategically pull out characters with different skills to win these battles. The graphics are high quality and the battles are so intense and satisfying. There are so many new champions you can add to your team. And my favorite has got to be Kyle and the Sniper because they can attack all enemies at the same time, which is a skill that the team really needs to win battles. But here's the big news. Our sponsor, Raid, is celebrating its fifth anniversary. They're giving away bonuses worth $100, including Epic Champion Lady Atessa and 500K silver. Get to level 25 and there's more silver and rewards waiting. I wish I'd gotten this when I started playing. These bonuses are available by downloading Rave only via my link in the description or this QR code and using the festive promo code FESTIVAL5. So don't wait, use my link in the description and let's meet on the battlefield. My username is Dark Megan, and you can also join my clan, which is also Dark Megan. Let's play this together. If you want to, check out my clan details. See you in Raid. On the morning of December 27th, 2016, around 9.45 a.m., Shayla Putri came to the Triono family's posh house. Shayla was a friend of the family's daughter, Diona Arika, and they planned to hang out. Shayla had tried calling and texting Diona, but got no response, so she decided to drop by. When she arrived, the house seemed off. The gate and the garage door were slightly open, but no one was in sight, no maids, no drivers. Something felt wrong. Then Shayla's heart sank. She heard faint cries for help from inside the house. Being young, it's normal she was scared. She ran to a nearby security post and told the guard about the situation. The guard quickly called the police for help. It took some time for the police to arrive, and by then, curious neighbors had gathered around. The police got a quick rundown and began searching the house, soon realizing the cries were from a restroom on the first floor near the maid's room. The restroom was very small, measuring only about 1.5 by 1.5 square meters and was intended for basic toilet needs. Security guards and police officers had to break down the door and inside they found a shocking scene. 11 people were crammed in there, stacked on top of each other. Tragically, six of them had already died due to a lack of oxygen. Ghani, a local community leader, reported that Dodi Triono, the family patriarch, appeared to have been stabbed in the neck. The five other individuals found in the restroom were alive, but had sustained injuries and were suffering from dangerously low oxygen levels in their blood. They were quickly rushed to the hospital for urgent medical care. Those who died were Dodi Triono, who was 59 years old at the time, Diona Arika, who was 16, 
Dianita Gemma, who was nine, Amel, a friend of one of the children, Yanto and Tasrok, who was the family's driver. Zanet Kalila, who was 13, Santi, 22, Emmy, Fitriani, and Windy, who were the housemaids, all survived. After the gruesome discovery, the deceased were laid down in the living room, while the police secured the area and began their investigation. The police initially suspected murder and conducted a thorough search of the house for further evidence. As news of the incident spread, a crowd gathered around the scene, and the families of the victims in particular were overwhelmed with grief. Upon arriving at the scene, the police quickly noticed CCTV cameras installed around the house. They understood that these cameras likely captured the events leading up to the tragedy, making them a vital source of evidence. Now let's take a look at what had been captured on CCTV. On the afternoon of December 26, 2016, a Suzuki Artiga car pulled up in front of a house in Bulo Gadung, East Jakarta. A man named Yuspane got out and looked around carefully, as if to check if anyone was watching. Yus wasn't alone. His accomplices, Erwin Situmarang, Ramlan Butar Butar, and Sinaga were in the car, waiting for his signal. After scouting the area, Yus headed to the gate. The gate was unlocked. When he approached Yanto, one of the family's drivers came up to him. Yanto asked Ramlan if they needed anything from the homeowners. The response was immediate and threatening. A machete was pointed at him. Yuspane ordered Yanto to close the garage door and signal the others to get out of the car. Ramlan and Erwin joined Yus, while Sinaga stayed in the car to keep watch. Faced with several men wielding weapons, Yanto was terrified and had no choice but to follow their commands. The intruders headed towards the living room. At that moment, nine-year-old Dianita Gemma and her friend Amel were coming downstairs playing. The maid Santi was busy with her chores. The two girls stopped suddenly when they saw an unfamiliar man coming from the garage. Santi was startled and tried to run for help, but she quickly realized that they had also captured Yanto. Ramlan grabbed Santi and forced her to sit down, while Yanto, pushed by the intruders, opened his arm to embrace and protect the frightened girls. The commotion drew the attention of the babysitters, Fitriani and Windy, who came out of their room. Yuspane spotted them and ordered them to join the others on the floor. It's unclear whose idea it was, but the intruders decided to herd their captives into the small restroom, making it easier for them to search the house for valuables. Santi was singled out to guide them to the valuables. She was taken upstairs at gunpoint. On the second floor, Yuspane instructed Santi to open the first room they came across, which belonged to 13-year-old Zanet Kalila. Zanet, terrified, was forced out of her room. Ramlan then went upstairs to check on them. After gathering both upstairs, they were brought back down. It was noted that Ramlan struck one of the girls without any provocation. Yuspane went back upstairs to keep looking for things to steal. That's when he entered the room of 16-year-old Diona Arika. Diona tried to run away, but Yus caught her and dragged her by her hair through the corridor. She fought back hard and pleaded for mercy, but Yus responded by hitting her on the head with his gun. She kept resisting, even holding onto the staircase to avoid being taken downstairs, but Yus hit her again, this time in the chest, weakening her. With help from his partner, they finally took Diona down to the restroom where the others were. Then, Yus took the youngest daughter, Gemma, upstairs to show him where her parents' room was. At this time, another family driver named Tasrok arrived on his motorcycle. Sinaga, who was keeping watch, approached Tasrok, who didn't realize what was happening at first. Ramlan heard the motorcycle and came out too. Tasrok soon understood the danger, but couldn't do much as he saw the guns and was forced by Ramlan to join the others in the restroom. 
With everyone under control, the intruders started taking valuables from the house. They stuffed everything into a blue bag that Erin was carrying. Once they thought they had enough, they got ready to leave. But they faced a new problem. 59-year-old Dodi Triono, the head of the household, had just come home in his gray car. Dodi Triono arrived home without suspecting anything amiss, as Ramlan opened the gate for him to park his car. After Dodi got out of his car, Ramlan closed the gate, and Dodi was confronted by the strangers. Confused, Dodi tried to argue with them, but they quickly silenced him with their weapons. Erwin Situmoran called Yuspane over, telling him that they had another person to lock in the restroom. Dodi was then escorted inside by Ramlan and Erwin, who demanded his wallet and phone. After taking his belongings, they pushed Dodi into the restroom with the others. The intruders then locked the restroom door and threw away the key. To make matters worse, they cut the electrical power, stopping the ventilation fan in the restroom. This left 11 people trapped in a small, dark, unventilated restroom, screaming for help and begging to be released. But the robbers ignored their pleas, satisfied with the loot they had gathered, and left the house. The victims remained locked in that restroom for about 19 hours. What the criminals didn't know was that the house was equipped with CCTV cameras, which recorded their entire crime. This footage made it easy for the police to identify and track them down. The police acted swiftly to locate the perpetrators, forming a team for the mission and quickly moving to apprehend them. On a Wednesday afternoon, the police set up an ambush for Ramlan, Erwin, and Sanaga in the Rawalumbu district of Bukasi. When the police closed in, the men tried to escape and resisted with their weapons. This led to a confrontation with the police firing shots, startling the neighborhood with the loud sounds of gunfire. Ramlan had been shot in the leg, but died because of blood loss, while Aaron was also shot in the leg. Yuspana and Sanaga initially managed to escape. The police quickly followed up, not wasting any time. Sinaga was eventually caught and arrested in Vilamas Inda in Bekasi. Yuspane fled to Medan but was apprehended after Erwin cooperated with the police and provided information about his whereabouts. Further investigation and interrogation shed light on each man's role in the crime. Ramlan Putar Putar was identified as the leader, while Erwin Situmarang and Yuspane executed the plan. Sanaga had the role of the driver. The group had created their robbery plan while they were in Bogor, West Java. Their first step was to find a suitable target, leading them to drive around elite neighborhoods looking for opportunities. According to Yuspane, they found other houses locked, but the Triono house wasn't, making it an easy target for them to sneak into. The confessions from the remaining members of the robbery group initially led to the conclusion that the incident was a botched robbery. However, Azam Khan, the lawyer of the Triono family, had doubts about this theory. He suggested to the media that the crime might have been a premeditated murder, targeting Dodi Triono and his family. Azam pointed out that the items reported stolen $461, a Rolex watch, and some phones didn't seem enough to indicate a typical robbery, suggesting more valuables would have been taken in that case. In contrast, Inspector General Iriawan stated that the robbers had taken approximately 7 million rupiah in cash, along with various foreign currencies including Thai baht, Singapore dollars, and US dollars. Along with the Rolex and the phones, the total value of the stolen items was estimated at around 60 million Indonesian rupiah. The speculation about Dodi Triono's background added another layer to the case. Dodi was a wealthy and successful architect involved in many high-profile property projects. His wealth was evident in the multiple houses he owned and his collection of luxury cars. This led to public speculation that the robbery could have been a hit 
ordered by one of Dodi's business rivals. Although there was no concrete evidence or confession from the robbers to support this theory. Dodi Triono's personal life also came under scrutiny. He had been married three times. His first marriage was to a woman named Dewi, with whom he had three children. They divorced six years before the tragic incident. Dodi's second wife was Almia de Shafira, with whom he had three more children, Diona, Zanet, and Gemma. Dodi divorced Amienda three years before the tragedy. After the divorce, the three children from his second marriage chose to live with him. Dodi Triono had entered into a third marriage, but it wasn't officially recorded in legal documents. His partner, who wasn't living with him at the time of the incident, was seven months pregnant when the tragedy occurred. This led to public speculation about the involvement of one of Dodi's ex-wives in the crime, possibly hiring the robbers as hitmen. But this theory was dismissed because of a lack of evidence to support it. Ultimately, the Jakarta Police Chief, Inspector General Iriawan, said that the crime was purely a robbery. He explained that Yus and his team had robbed two other houses in different locations in just a week before hitting Bulomas. Despite their ruthless approach, there was no record of them ever killing their victims, according to the police. One of the robbers, Erwin, felt so guilty after finding out that victims had died, he even asked the police to shoot him. He had been involved in several robberies before, but this was the first time his actions had led to deaths. The Jakarta police spokesman, Mr. Argo, noted that it was typical for the Skang to gather all the victims into one room during their robberies. Additionally, Mr. Argo argued that Dodi Triono was not stabbed by the robbers. The autopsy conducted on the deceased at the Indonesian National Police Hospital showed that the bleeding was caused by burst blood vessels due to lack of oxygen. Blood had seeped out of the bodies through various openings, primarily the nose. As Dodi was at the bottom of the pile in the restroom, this position likely exacerbated his bleeding. This finding challenged the theory of a planned murder as there was no evidence of deliberate stabbing. Dodi, Gemma, and Diona Triono were laid to rest side by side at Tenakusir Public Cemetery in South Jakarta. Their funeral was held on December 28, 2016, and the place was filled with family and friends all mourning together. Zanette, who lost her whole immediate family, was visibly shattered. Dodi's second wife, Almianda, was there too, thanking everyone who was there for them during such a hard time. Amel, Gemma's friend, who was also a victim of the tragedy, was buried in Jatisari Public Cemetery in Bekasi. Her funeral was attended by friends, teachers, and family members who came together to mourn and pay their respects to the young girl whose life was tragically cut short. The bodies of the family drivers, Yanto and Tasrok, were taken by their families for private burials, away from media attention. Yanto left behind a wife and two small daughters. His wife talked about him being such a good dad, especially sad because he just started working again with the Trionos. The trial to bring the perpetrators to justice began on June 15, 2017. The defendants faced several charges, including premeditated murder, theft with violence, aggravated theft, and imprisonment. On September 19, 2017, the court delivered its verdict. Yuspane and Erwin Situmurang received the death penalty, while Sinaga was sentenced to life in prison. Following the verdict, the defense attorney filed an appeal. Yuspane expressed remorse, saying, We're truly sorry. We had no intention of killing those people. But what happened was beyond our control. Erwin Situmurang also expressed his wish to kneel before the families of the victims and express his deep regret for his actions. The lawyers representing the suspects argued that the punishment should be based objectively on the motive and not just on the accidental number of victims or public pressure. 
However, their appeal was ultimately rejected by the Supreme Court on July 2nd, 2018, and both men remain on death row. In the aftermath, the house where the tragedy occurred took on a morbid fascination for some. It was abandoned and unfortunately became a site for ghost hunting, spurred by rumors and claims of eerie cries heard nearby. Zanet, deeply affected by the loss and the ongoing attention to the house, pleaded on Instagram for people to stop treating the site disrespectfully. Eventually, after much difficulty due to the unsettling rumors, the house was sold. Almost a decade has passed since this terrible event that robbed numerous individuals of their loved ones. The workers involved were simply earning a living to support their families, and the children were looking forward to enjoying their holiday. None of them deserved such a brutal end. We extend our heartfelt condolences to the families and loved ones of those who lost their lives. We hope for peace for the departed and healing for the survivors, both physically and emotionally. And for everyone else, let's hope for safety and security in our lives. That's all for today. Thanks for watching.